So the scripture I'm going to read tonight is Luke 18, and it's the first eight verses. And he told them a parable to the effect that they, always, they ought always to pray and not lose heart. He said, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. There was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, Give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused, but afterwards he said to himself, Though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by your continually coming. And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge says. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, he will find faith on earth. So I, I called this prayer. The last week was about prayer related and, and, two week, and next week will be prayer also in the morning service. So give you a little background here. We know this wasn't a Jewish judge. Normally, if you were a Jewish person and you had a problem with somebody that was also Jewish, you would have gone to the elders of the church and they would have tried to resolve it. If you weren't able to resolve whatever your issues were, then uh, each of the two parties would get to have one judge and then there would be a neutral judge. And so one of those three, whatever those three judges said would be the answer. That was how it was going to be directed. Now, we know this judge then, since it wasn't any of that stuff going on, we know this judge was appointed by the Romans. And because he was totally corrupt, because that's the way of the time, he would have not been wanting to give the lady an answer till she bribed him. Because that's what was expected. So now I know sometimes people get upset with courts around here. I'm going to talk about Judge Marianne Voorhees a little bit today because I've known her since we're about the same age. Her dad was a coach of mine, so I've known her since she was like 14 or 15. She's retiring this year, so you can't vote for her anymore, so we're good to go. Um, but she's just always been a person I respected. And, and I think if you go through and look at her trials, you see that most of the time she's not, when someone appeals, she's not overturned. But two years ago, I got to go to her court. So how many of you here have ever got to go to court either as a juror that you were called to be a juror or that you just got to go to court because, yeah. So this was my second time getting called for jury duty. There was about 40 of us there that day. And um, they got the first six or seven of the, I think they were keeping 13 persons for this one for whatever reason. And the, one of the ladies who was pretty far down the line asked the court bailiff, she said, hey, looks to me like they're pretty much done. Or I mean, you know, they might need four or five. I'm like 40. Can some number of us go? And he asked Judge Voorhees. And she said, I don't think we need anybody from 30 on. So like 30 through 50 or whatever was there. You guys can go, but if you're 30 and under, we're going to keep you. I was like 28. <laughs> and if you haven't been for a while, once you get there and they give you a number, you always set in the same number order. And so Number, the guy number 29 was on, and maybe I was 30. I mean, there weren't very many people to the left of me sitting there waiting. And so we had to wait, and they were going through the last few people, and they finally got the jury picked. And there's like six of us that would just spend our day there about half the day for no real apparent reason. And so we were getting ready to leave, and she was thanking us all for coming. And she said, Mr. Armantrout, and I said, yes, Your Honor. She said, I was really looking forward to having you on this jury today. And I said, hey, been here all day. You guys didn't pick me. She goes, the next time you come back, we'll see if we can take care of that. <laughs> but I haven't been called back. Um, but we expect our judges to be fair. We don't expect that we're going to have to bribe them. And for all the judges that we have in the United States, you, every once in a while, Somebody does something bad and you see them uh, getting in some kind of trouble. But for the most part, our judges are fair and they do what's the right thing. That just would not have been what the deal was here um, for this lady. So what she represents is a symbol of the poor and defenseless people. She didn't have any money that she could bribe the judge with. She didn't have anything she could sell. She didn't have any like cows or lambs or cattle or anything that she could say, well, I'll give you this if you'll um, 
make your decision in my favor. She just didn't have the ability to do that. And so therefore, since she didn't have any money or resources, she really didn't have any chance of having justice. No matter what the other party had, she had no chance because she didn't have anything to give them. But the one thing she did have was persistence. Now the version I read today, it says bothers me. My other Bible, it said exhaust me is the phrase. Does anybody have their Bible open, have one or the other? Does yours say exhaust me or? Oh, it's probably like the middle of that, somewhere around five or six. But She's weary. weary me. And so different translations of that. But what it means is that this is more than just persistence. There's some thought that she might try to harm him. And so the one translation I looked up said, translates to give a, a black eye or possibly a physical confrontation. And, and so between her coming and going, and he's not gonna get anything from her, and he's really just tired. And he says, okay, I'm just gonna make a decision because I wanna be done with you. And I'm a little afraid of you kind of at the same time. Well, what this, for us, what this is really about is going to the Lord, not just one time in prayer, and then expecting what we want to have happen, happen. And so I'm gonna use the idea of a father helping a child. And since I don't have any childs anymore, children's, <laughs> I'm gonna use grandkids. And we got to have them this week, and so I have, these aren't particularly recent examples, but these are the things they do to frustrate me sometimes. So when we go into Muncie on 32, has anybody seen the really fancy golf cart place there? It's kind of around the Youth Opportunity Center. I mean, like they've got the spinner wheels, they're all jacked up, really pretty colors. You know, they've got a bench seat on the back. They are really cool. Even, even I, I don't really want a golf cart, but even I think they're really cool to look at. We're going by one day and Sawyer looks out the window, this is a seven year old, and he says, not to me, he goes, hey, grandma, I think we should buy one of those golf carts for grandpa. And she said, why do you think grandpa would like a golf cart? And he went, well, then he'd be taking me around town on a golf cart and I'd get to ride in it. Sometimes I'd get to drive in it. She said, well, that sounds more like for you than grandpa. No, it's for grandpa. <laughs> And so we haven't bought a golf cart because A, we don't need one and, and it's just not necessary. Now, so it was a polite way of telling him no, we weren't gonna do that, but sometimes God tells us no because he knows what's best for us in the long run. Now my better opportunity to get injured grandchildren is this. When we bought, after we got rid of cats, we got new furniture in the house. And Benita has, it's like a, it's not a chair, and it's not an easy boy. It's like a chair and a half wide, kind of you could almost curl up in it, but it comes with this big giant footstool. And you know, you don't get footstools with stuff as much as you used to. And so not very long after we got it, all three grandchildren figured out that you can stand on the footstool and jump to the chair. <laughs> or you can stand on the chair and jump to the footstool. Problem is, the footstool has wheels on it. Now it doesn't roll real easy. Yes, you can all see how this could turn into a disaster. And that particular chair is by the fireplace. So there's some bricks to fall on. And so whenever I'm around and they start to do it, or even they stand on one, I go, no, you may not jump from the footstool to the chair. Why? Because I'm afraid you'll get hurt. And you know what they tell me? I won't get hurt because kids are indestructible. And I said, well, I'm glad you think that, but you're not gonna to get to do it, so we won't ever even get to find out. So one day, the granddaughter was there. I think she was four. She's four now, I think she was four then. And she stands up on the footstool, and I go, uh-uh, Sophia, you cannot jump from the footstool to the chair. And from the kitchen, I hear Grandma say, I told you Grandpa wasn't gonna let you do that. <laughs> Which implies that when I'm not around, she has a free pass to do that. Is that the way everybody else read that? That was the way I read it. And so Sophia looks at me and she's not very bashful. She said, Grandpa, I need you go, I need you to leave this room. 
And I said, well, two things. One, I'm not leaving the room. And two, you're not jumping from that footstool to the chair or from the chair to the footstool. You might get hurt, which she promptly told me that she would not get hurt. And I said, yes, I know, because you're not going to do it. And so we watch over, we watch over the kids, we watch over the grandkids, because we don't want them to get hurt. Now, we can't always do that, but God tries to do that same thing with us. And so the problem for us is we want stuff to happen now. And we're kind of an, I, I, this probably isn't new, but we're kind of an instant gratification. So when we pray, pray, we want it to be now. And we kind of only think in the short run. Now, I kind of, the way I came up with the kids jumping is in the short run, that's great fun to jump from one to the other because they're not planning on falling and getting hurt. I hope they don't get hurt, but because I'm older, I've seen people fall and get hurt doing stuff like that. And so I don't want them to get hurt. So for us, when we pray, sometimes we get dissatisfied or anxious with God because we don't get the answer we want. Where I've seen that happen a lot, if you have someone who has serious illness, um, they have family emergencies, and they go to God and they pray and they want this to be answered right away. Well, sometimes that's not the way it works. So when I was at Honey Creek, we had a lady who had throat cancer. And my sister-in-law in Birmingham had just finished her chemo treatments and everything. And I haven't seen that lady for about a year, but everything was okay. And so she was explaining to the congregation what her problems were. And I said, you know, you might want to talk to my sister-in-law because the doctors are, would always tell her what was going on, but they didn't always tell her in a way that it was easily understandable. And I said, maybe you want to just talk to Donna and she can kind of help you through this. Because I said, her treatments lasted about a year. And she said, yeah, that's what the doctors are telling me. And I said, one of the things that they forgot to tell her was some of those treatments caused her to have throat issues to where she had trouble eating almost for a year afterwards. So the Thanksgiving after she was done, we're all eating really nice, you know, pumpkin pie and all that. And she's putting thickener in anything that she tries to eat or drink because her throat's just not working the way it did before. And, and so the last time I talked with her, everything was going okay. And as I was leaving the church, she came up to me one day and she said, you know, the reason you, I've decided the reason that you were appointed to that church is so you could put me in contact with Donna. Because I needed somebody like that that had gone through what I was going through to explain to me what was going to happen because I just was so anxious about it. Well, God tries to do that same th thing for us. We want the answer to be right away, but sometimes God knows we're better off if we can wait for things to happen. And that, that is hard for us because we want stuff now. And it probably doesn't help for the time we live in where if you want something, this winter, I wanted the day it snowed, like the only day it snowed, the day we had the five or six inches of snow, I decided I wanted a snow blower. I ordered it the day before and it came the day it snowed. Okay, people were talking about, oh, you can't get anything delivered. I thought, well, it must not be too hard because I got this snow blower from, you know, it was less than 24 hours from the time I ordered it to the time I was blowing snow off my driveway. I might have wanted to order that snow shovel a little sooner but since it had snowed, it didn't seem to be a big thing to worry about. But what this is telling us is that <clears throat> we need to be patient. When something doesn't happen the way we want it to happen right away, we don't want to become discouraged. The widow didn't care how many times the judge wouldn't settle her case. She would come back. So we're not trying to say we're going to pester God into getting the answer we want. It's that we're going to go to God and say, Lord, this is what I think I need. Can you guide me? Can you help me through that? So at the end of every prayer that I do, I always want to be careful that I don't make it a prayer for me. That I want it to be just what I want. 
And so whatever that is, I ask for God's guidance, for his direction. And so for me, I try to think or say, your will be done, not my will, because I recognize that sometimes what I think is the best for, thing for me isn't the best thing for me. But it's what I think is supposed to happen right that instant. Now, I'm not always good at this because sometimes it's something that I think is really important and I think it really should happen the way I want it to. But my effort is to try to make it God's will and not my will. That's what I think this whole scripture is about. That if we go to the Lord for prayer one time and whatever we're seeking guidance on or advice or whatever you're looking for, if it doesn't happen, that doesn't mean we should just give up that we should have faith in the Lord to go because maybe what we're asking for isn't exactly what God's gonna do in our lives, but we might not be ready to hear what that guidance is gonna be, or maybe he's telling us and we're just not able to do it at that time. And so as we go through life and we go to prayer to the Lord, think about are we asking what um, we want from God, or are we asking for God's direction and help on those things in our lives? Amen? Let us pray. Father, we're so thankful and grateful for all you do for us each and every day. Let us be open to your guidance and direction. Um, our prayers do not fall on deaf ears. Sometimes we just do not understand the answer or the direction that you're taking our lives. We ask for um, your faith in us, the grace that you share with us, the love you give us each and every day. Let us be observant to all those things you put in our lives and all those people that you place in our lives. Amen.